Why, hello, welcome to a Theology Pugcast. It's really nice to have you here and to enjoy this show with us today. We're looking forward to a, 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 a conversation with a friend, and uh, we'll, inter- we'll let him introduce himself in a moment. But I'm C.R. Wiley. I'm a pastor. I serve a church in the Pacific Northwest, and I've written books. Enough about me. How about you, Tom? <laughs> I'm Tom Price. I teach uh, theology, philosophy, and ethics, and one of the places is Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. Great. So we'll kick it over to you now, Glenn, and and have you introduce our guest. I'm Glenn Sunshine, a retired history professor, senior fellow at the Colson Center, ministry associate at Reflections Ministries, and a couple of other odds and ends. Um, And our our guest today is a man named Kemper Crabb. Uh, I first ran into Kemper's music uh, back around 1980, and I've been a fan ever since, and somehow we finally managed to connect with each other. So, um, Kemper, I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, You know the drill here. Uh, Let our audience know what it is that you want them to know about you, and then we'll take it from there. Well, there's there's, uh, not a whole lot to know. I I started... uh making music back in the in the 70s, I guess. I, I was in one of the hearts of the Jesus movement, and uh, so I started making music then, so consequently I was, I guess I was kind of on the ground floor of what eventually became uh, CCM. And, uh, you know, and then, but all along the way, I've, I've pastored. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an Episcopal priest who's currently serving uh, in a pastoral role in a in a Missouri Synod Lutheran church. <laughs> wow. uh, yeah, I was on staff at Second Baptist here in Houston for a while and and uh, all, all sorts of things. I, I suppose the coming out of the Jesus movement, I, I had less of a huge denominational drive, although I'm <laughs> pretty confessional, you know, so... Uh, right. so that, but that's what I do. I teach, I teach part-time. I teach uh, high school, 10th graders uh, in a classical education uh, charter school. I teach uh, humane letters, which is a combination of literature and, and history. Together, you know, my specialization in terms of education was uh, medieval history and literature. And uh, hmm. so it kind of seeped into my music. And, and uh, so I, I do pastoral things. I, do, I still do music and, uh, and I teach school. Cool. Yeah. Um, A couple of other just sort of side notes here about Kemper. I remember running into a description of him way back in the 80s from uh, uh, John Michael Talbot, who described him as a an evangelical pastor with hair down to his waist who knew the church fathers. <laughs> you got you got a haircut, Kemper, I see. Well, I did. I, I, I used to be really long. I mean, it was I could sit on my hair back when, but uh, but I went to I went to India. My dad was a missionary. I went to India with him for a while in the in the bush. There were lice and stuff, so that's where I first cut my hair short. Yeah, that'll, to that'll keep from it. <laughs> yeah, that that'll motivate you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I I think good place to start is with your music because that's probably what you're best known for. Though you're also an author, um, and uh, I especially enjoyed reading your blog as well. But <laughs> but going going back to to the music. Um, the, the first album of yours, and I, I think this may have been your first album, might have been your second, was Archangel, or, or with Archangel, an album called Warrior. And one of the things that I'm struck by going back to it now is that in some ways, at least, it anticipates a movement that my, my son actually made me aware of uh, that's called Medieval Metal. Right. It's, it, you know, it, for those of you who don't know, metal is a very, very broad category. You've got symphonic <laughs> metal, you've got Celtic metal, you've got, um, yeah. you know, on and on. Well, there's, there's actually a genre called medieval metal. And Archangel, in a lot of ways, well before anybody else was doing this kind of thing that I know of, um, it really anticipated some of uh, the direction that that would take. Now, nowadays, it's mostly pagan. Uh, in your case, it was very definitely Christian. So I wanted to talk to you, start off talking about um, the way uh, 
medieval music, medieval ideas uh, helped uh, shape your music. And then from there, um, you're thinking in other areas. Uh, yeah, I, uh, of course, you know, I've always, uh, what, what actually happened is, is I, I got the initial Tolkien books, the official releases on Ballantyne when they first came in when I was, I think yeah. I was in third grade. And uh, yeah. so I'm on a table in the store uh, and and thought, oh, this looks like great cover. My dad bought it for me. And I, I read those through and I got to the appendices at the end of uh, The Lord of the Ring and, and uh, got obsessed with runes first. And at that point, uh, I read everything I could find. I, I think everything that was in print in English on runes at the time. And, uh, yeah. you know, that got me interested. I realized that there actually were, they were based on real runes and that led me into studying medieval history. Um, and, you know, I, I became astounded when I was in high school because I realized that there were recordings of, you know, medieval music and so forth. The music of the Crusades was one of the first ones that I found. And uh, all along, however, I'd been involved in, in, in music um, after the Jesus movement. Uh, you know, it, it, a, a bunch of us started making music that uh, basically promoted Christianity to the larger culture. There wasn't any CCM or anything like that at the time. So, you know, we we were, com you know, comparing ourselves to Jethro Tull and King Crimson and, and bands like that. And, uh, you know, and, and I mean, this was very early on before there was a CCM or, I mean, Christian quote unquote music was, was Southern gospel, which didn't, didn't exactly trip my trigger. So, uh, <laughs> so most of us, you know, us, a few things, there's Resurrection Band and uh, the very early Petra, Larry Norman and the SoCal guys and stuff yeah. like that. All, all of us knew each other because there weren't many of us. But we were playing clubs and parks and wherever they'd let us play. It was difficult to get into churches at the time. But, but uh, all along that time, I was reading medieval literature and realized that the Middle Ages was uh, in many ways an attempt to instantiate the city of God, you know, in society. And although I knew there were a bunch of uh, ways that they kind of screwed it up, I also thought that in many ways it was vastly superior to what was going on in the modern culture. So, yeah. you know, that led me to, by the time I got to college, to, to really uh, focus my studies and so forth on that. And, uh, and of course, you know, since I was a Christian, it was made even more overwhelmingly true to me. So it, it seeped into my music as I, I kind of split my, my time between writing things that were medieval-esque in, in terms of their melodies and, and, uh, and the lyrics. I, I was kind of, I was influenced by a lot of the, what used to be called art rock guys. I think they're called progressive rock guys now, but right. it was more poetic rendering and, and so forth. And, uh, you know, so I, I was writing about Christian things along those lines, uh, but influenced by that. And the, the guys that were in the band with me that I, I founded, uh, Archangel, you know, they, uh, I was teaching them and, and trying to teach them musical forms and stuff from that. And, uh, but at the same time, I was very much involved in, in rock music and popular music and so forth. So, so it, it's kind of blended together. It, it, uh, you know, but but most of the bands that I liked were uh, had uh, had albums that were epic in their kind of scope and and uh, yeah. you know had an overarching theme and so forth and so you know I had a number of songs that kind of fit together in that in that fashion. I mean, as a matter of fact, I think uh, on that album one one face and those you know there were LPs in those days was one side was wind face and the other was fire face. So one of them was more acoustically oriented and a little more medieval mm -hmm. in its orientation. And then Fireface was a lot more rock and so forth. And uh, although, like I said, it was mostly art rock, you know, we, we uh, early on in my career, I, I knew that if I wanted it to be the way I wanted, I was going to have to learn a lot of instruments. So instead of becoming a, a virtuoso in one particular thing, I, I learned to play a bunch of different instruments. And at the time, they didn't have samplers. So if you wanted a recorder or something, you 
You had to play recorder if you wanted, yeah. you know, if you wanted mandolin, you had to play mandolin. You, you didn't have any of this, yeah. this other stuff, sampling. So, so that got infused into the into the band. People thought that was very interesting and kept me from getting bored. I think I would have burned out <laughs> hard if I had studied, yeah. you know, one instrument all along. So that became part of it. And of, and of course, a lot of those instruments I went back in time for to play harp and. Uh, you know, yeah, Kemp, of that sort. So Kemper, one of the things that's interesting to the to me about this is that when I think about the early seventies and sort of the formative years of CCM and so forth, I don't think about medieval music. I think about stuff that is a kind of Christian Christian version of, say, I don't know, Southern California rock and roll sound right. stuff. You know, right. uh, w- was there was there much interest in medieval music uh, among other musicians that you were hanging out with? Yeah, and uh, I mean, Glenn kind of, you know, he, he sort of made a comment about uh, medieval metal that didn't develop until much later. But most of the time, people who are into hard rock um, generally were drawn to the kind of modalities that medieval music was expressed in and so forth. And, uh, and as time went along, that, that gathered steam. At the time that I was doing that, the only bands I knew that did anything like that were, uh, I mean, Jethro Tull had overtones of that. And, uh, you know, yes, occasionally, but not, yeah. not really so much. But, uh, but I, you know, I mean, it was really, like I said, because I was actually listening to as much medieval music as I could find on, on an album. And uh, and trying to play those instruments, so so that that was. Uh, but people thought it was very interesting, especially people who liked rock music, because it th- there is a, a connection there, um, and there's certain modalities. I mean, even if you listen to Led Zeppelin, a lot of the leads and stuff that are structured are structured on very modal lines that, that very much recall medieval kind of approaches, or, or even uh, Middle Eastern approaches, and of course medieval music shaped the way it was because the Crusades and stuff, there's all this trade with the Muslims and right. and they brought back all these instruments and so forth and it, it shaped the whole direction of medieval music and huh. even to some extent thereafter. But So people were interested, they were always interested, especially if I pulled out weird instruments, you know. <laughs> At the time, that was a, that was a, a big deal in the culture, so it, it helped right. us a lot, I think. Right, right. I didn't count, but I read a review that said that on Archangel, you listed something like 38 instruments. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. Uh, varieties of synthesizers, but then also these all these various acoustic and medieval instruments. Yeah, when I by the time I did uh, uh, Reliquarium, which is the most recent release, I think, that I did, I, I, I counted them all up. I played everything that I had at the time, which was 44 instruments. And I've picked up two or three since then, but, but you know, I just, uh, I mean, it keeps, keeps me from getting bored and I think it gives interesting sort of textures, you know, to the music if you do that. And an uh, interesting thing, thing about the period that you were producing uh, that music and, and growing up is it was really rich all around. Um, like you said, there was, uh, I think in the kind of wider, culture you had bands like yes uh pink floyd led zeppelin um even the the you know the more g- general rock that came a little later bands like boston and i mean they they produced so much great music and were so innovative that you were a part of a time that i think the inspiration to try new things and and push the limits of music with a band, um, it, I don't think it's I don't think it will ever be matched. I I did my undergrad in music, but this was in you know the mid '90s, and so I was listening to the music that you all had produced for for the kind of stuff that you know our bands wanted to try, and it was already starting to move away from that to more simplistic chords and losing you know the melody. So you really were. Sp- you really were innovators in many ways, just uh, just your location and time. Well, it was it was definitely very interesting, a very interesting period of time in the 90s. And you're talking about all the interesting stuff was not in the mainstream pop world. It was in things like uh, there were certain brands of country music and, and the dance yeah. music was very creative and stuff like that. But popular music was, you know, it was really kind of became more and more streamlined. A lot of that had to do with the way radio 
people discovered that if they programmed everything in a particular way, it kind of killed the creativity because if you wanted to make a living, you, you know, you conformed yourself to a particular mode. And yeah. That's it, fascinating, Kepper. Yeah. I think that that's something I'd like to explore, explore a little bit. You know, I'll, uh, uh, sit up uh, and listen and watch uh, like the greatest hits of 1976 or something like that. Sure. And they'll start with 100. Now I think that's 100. <laughs> and on the countdown, you know, there was just so much great stuff. And and my son's a musician, and I talked to other younger people, and they all agree that that was a a much more, I guess, creative and uh, musically. I guess, you know, complex time than we have now. But what I'm hearing you say that is that there are these economic forces that are driving us toward uh, standardization and uh, absolutely mediocrity. Mm. Yeah, when in the in the mid 90s, I began to say people were very excited about uh, the digital formats that come online and and uh, st- streaming, which eventually became and so forth. And at the time I started telling my friends, this is going to be the end of the big labels and the end of the radio. And, uh, mm. and they all thought I was crazy. And I said, I said, it can't be any other way. I said, you know, yeah. it's being sold as, look, there'll be all this possibility for new bands, uh, but people, you know, the, the whole record industry thing forced bands to be individual and good at what, really good at what they were doing because the record label wasn't going to, drop a lot of money on somebody they didn't think they could make their money back on. So they wanted somebody that had an organization and, and that had been playing a while, had a following and so forth. And these days, the listener is forced to wade through the dreck, you yeah. know, whereas it used to be, it used to be the, the label. So it's, it, it dealt a really severe blow to creativity and drove people into a lot of other, you know, uh, formats or interests and so forth. You know, so there are a lot of people who, if, if that was still going on, would be in rock or some kind of popular music, but now they're in video or, or video games yeah. or something like that. Another dimension to this that I've wondered about, and again, I'm an outsider. Uh, the three of you are insiders when it comes to music. I'm just a, a visual artist. <laughs> but <laughs> when I think about the bands of the 70s and 60s, it seemed like the people who were in those bands had some classical training. And were were really uh, good musicians, and who got into popular music from that direction, rather than just you know sitting at home trying to master a few chords on a guitar and then trying to become big or something. That's very much true, uh, you know, of uh, of a lot of the players. I mean, I it was weird. I came from kind of a different place because I was essentially a folk musician prior to that, which is one of the reasons why I also was, was used to playing a lot of instruments. But, but you know, when, when that stuff started happening, and I guess first for me it was soul music. San Antonio had a radio station called KAPE, the soul of San Antonio. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, in those early days I liked that. But then by the, by the, by the late 60s, uh, you know, when psychedelic rock and stuff like that, Again, to come in, the Beatles were so big and so forth. Uh, you know, it just it, it drew me very much into into like embracing a bunch of the different modes, and that's kind of what made the 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 whole period so interesting. Is because there was all this blending of styles and musical yeah. backgrounds and stuff going on that that doesn't really happen much anymore. You know, so that was a uh, that was a significant factor. In, in, in talking about the folk music part, because I, a lot of people, I, maybe our, our younger crowd may not be familiar, but that, that was such a, a rich um, force of musical energy right around, uh, you know, late 60s, early 70s. Um, I think I, I was in middle school when we watched uh, in our music appreciation class, A History of Music in America, that, that famous. And when I saw the folk scene, and I grew up in that kind of religious context. I almost saw it in many ways, especially with early Dylan and things like that. I saw it almost as carrying a, a prophetic element that I that resonated in the kind of fundamentalist circles I grew up with because there was a there was a moral seriousness about it. And so you came out, out of that whole, I guess, uh, other figures. Maybe I think John John Michael Talbot and and um, Phil Kagey, some of his earlier work. 
Um, there was a, there was a spiritual kind of uh, the folk scene allowed for a lot of spiritual conversation that maybe the pop scene today wouldn't allow for. W- would I be correct in saying that? I think you're absolutely correct, and and I think that's part of the reason why the music of the Jesus movement was oriented in that way. Because uh, you know a lot of a lot of the rock. I mean, I was in a rock band, and it was. People didn't exactly know what to do with that in the church, which is why we would play yeah. a lot yeah. of mainstream venues. And only gradually uh, did the church kind of wake up to the fact that, well, maybe it's not of the devil or something. And uh, <laughs> But the folk music was easy for people to absorb, and the kind of songs that were written were basically written so that people would know Scripture. So they were pretty simple yeah. renditions of Scripture. And, I mean, I, I still know tons of the Scripture, I know, because that was— that was what was played in the churches, at least amongst the, yeah. you know, the churches that, that that did something other than hymns. I grew up listening to hymns, and then when that happened, the folk music came in. But I already was listening to Johnny Mitchell in the early days, and Judy Collins, yeah. and you know, Dylan, yeah. and and even Simon and Garfunkel and stuff like that. Yeah. So, so it was an easy easy step into that. And you're absolutely right. There was a a moral seriousness. I mean, they were kind of reform oriented even though they were kind of uh, basically informed by kind of modernism and social yeah, right. action stuff like that but yeah. but they definitely saw themselves having a prophetic element i think you're dead right about hmm. that so kepper you, you've introduced an interesting uh, thought to me that i hadn't entertained before and and i'd like to kind of follow up on it see if i'm following you correctly so sort of the richest period then would be kind of the period before CCM and and the church is bringing things in and things you, you were kind of forced to just play the regular cl- the club scene and you were just another act among other acts uh, that, that you were you were Christians and it is that was that a better time I guess that's my thought uh, well in some ways it was um, uh, I've had a lot of people ask me about that because you know a lot of us the earlier bands in what became CCM, I guess, not only Archangel, but Res Band, who were, who were our sister band for a long time and stuff like that. I mean, we, you know, the churches weren't really having much of it, but, you know, we were musicians and, and we felt like that was that was a, a really valid way to reach the culture because we were part of that culture. It wasn't something we had to make up. That's, that's what we were. Yeah. And we viewed ourselves as our contemporaries were, King Crimson and Jethro Tull and stuff like yeah. that, and our those were our standards, not not some sort of infused sort of little pietistic hidey hole. Yeah. But, you know, we yeah. we were part of the culture at large, and we were speaking the gospel truth, as it were, into things. Uh, but but we weren't restricted near as much by having to say it in a particular way or anything like that. We were able to just say it the way that we would have written it as Christians, and it was much yeah. less restrictive. So, uh, yeah. you know, it was, it was interesting. I always had an interesting uh, love-hate relationship with CCM music because it it, uh, it became very canned. And, I mean, I can tell you all yeah. stories. I mean, I, I made a lot of my living as, as a writer and wrote for other bands and stuff like that. And uh, there were times when, you know, when, when the guys in the various labels, all of whom I knew in the Christian labels, would, call up and say, well, Kemper, uh, there was this one song I wrote called Don't Pass Me By, which uh, mm. it, it, you know, it was about how everybody Christians had the experience of some move of God starts happening in whatever tradition you're in. And, you know, you're sitting there going, I, I want this to happen. Don't, don't pass me by God. And sometimes <laughs> it does. Sometimes it doesn't. And God in his mercy doesn't always extend that. And I, I wrote a song about that 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 left it open-ended. You don't know whether or not God, you know, touches that person, however you want to describe that or not. But but this record label, a very popular Christian artist, loved this song and wanted to do it. And uh, they called me, and, and these were friends of mine, and said, uh, I want to know if you'd write a happy ending to the song. And I said, what do you mean a happy ending? And they said, well, you know, where, where something happens and you have this... I said, guys, you and I... I mean, we all know that that doesn't always happen. That's not reality. I said, you're asking me to, to tailor this to something that's not a reality, that's sort of utopian. And I said, I, I'm not going to do it. I mean, I could have made a lot of money, I guess, from doing that. But I said, I, 
I'm not going to do that. And they started laughing and said, well, we knew you wouldn't. But, uh, and they were, but they were right. But, but that's the kind of thing you were up against frequently in the CCM format because, you know, they were there to make money and, you know, they're up against a lot of the pietistic kind of understandings of things. I mean, I understood where they were coming from, but, but that's yeah. one of the things. You know, I've been on mainstream labels too, and they didn't have that kind of problem. They, you know, the only uh, censorship I ever experienced from a, from a non-Christian label uh, was Metal Blade and uh, in mm-hmm. Atomic Opera, because when we, we, we took our record to them, Gospel Cola, they actually did not like, uh, you know, part of our cover was uh, Jesus and the disciples were at the table for the Last Supper, that famous painting, but they all had a can of Gospel Cola in their hands <laughs> because we were kind of commenting on the, on the commercialism, you know, and, uh, and they, were, they, would, they wouldn't let us do it. I mean, you understand we're on a, we're on a label with, uh, you know, with, with uh, bands that are like dedicated to Satan. I mean, you know, and, 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 and they, didn't, was, they didn't want you to be, they didn't want you to do anything blasphemous. That's exactly right. And I said, are you guys kidding me? Are you guys like censoring us? And they were like, oh, no, no, we're not censoring you. And I said, well, then can we do the cover? No. So I said, so, wow, well, I can't wait to tell people that Metal Blade is censoring us and stuff. So, you know, but that's the only time that ever happened uh, with the mainstream people that I dealt with. So let me bring up an artist that uh, I was impressed with when I was younger. And uh, I know that he was kind of during, you know, he kind of came into his own during that period. That's Keith Green. Mm-hmm. You know, so he had an energy and a... Um, a virtuosity that just kind of was remarkable. I understand based on little I've read about his life that, you know, he could have been a Donny Osmond kind of figure. Uh, and then there were some things that occurred, the vicissitudes of fame and, you know, yeah. you know, music and promotion, all that kind of stuff. And he was kind of on the outside, but he was, but I, but I, I guess one of the things I liked about him is that it seems like, it was sort of nightclubs where he kind of developed his approach. It wasn't like, and then he tried to get into the church scene and it seemed like there was something about that transition that just wasn't very, I guess, natural. Yeah. Well, it, it's uh, like I said, by the, by the time Keith had left the mainstream kind of music world and, and the Christians uh, labels were very interested in him. There was a increasingly restricted kind of concept of, what would be acceptable in the churches. Um, you know, up in Illinois for years, uh, Jesus People USA hosted Cornerstone Festival. And Cornerstone yeah, Festival, right. which yeah. was always my favorite because all the bands that I liked that were Christian bands, as far as I was concerned, the only ones who were really worth listening to, would would be invited to okay. this, this yeah. big festival. And there were tons and tons of Christians that came, you know, literally hundreds of thousands. And, uh, but that's because most of the other festivals were more like Christian radio, which was, you know, more worried about stuff like that. But, uh, but except, except for that, uh, expression of that, generally speaking, if you, if you wanted to listen to a more, a more, you know, a band that had harder rock or that was less restricted that actually sang love songs or something like that, then you, you pretty much, you know, had to go to the, back section of the Christian stores if they were there or the, or the mainstream yeah. record stores, they, yeah. they carried stuff, you know? So, uh, so it was, it was, it was an interesting thing. I mean, I, when radio halo, which, which is what Archangel became and we, for years, we played clubs around here. We had a huge draw even on off nights and we'd play clubs and we never got any hassle for any kind of content we had and saw tons of conversions because people yeah. would come and hear us play and would come up and say, well, are you guys Christians? Or I mean, one time a girl said, are you guys Christians or something? I said, yeah. And she said, what <laughs> kind of Christians are you? And I said, well, you know, the creed confessing Bible believing type. And she said, so, so do you guys meditate? And uh, so I explained <laughs> to her the difference. She said, well, well, you know, I meet with a group every Wednesday uh, of about 75 people who do meditation. Would you come and talk to us about that? That kind of stuff happened all the time. 
And uh, wow. so, but when we when we were going to, Christian labels found out about that that we had a good following in this region, and uh, so I was approached and I was asked about, uh, you know, well, so I've listened to your record, Kemper, and uh, there aren't any evangelistic songs on there. And actually, there was one, but but I but I was like, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know. If it's going to be a Christian, I said, well, why would we want to evangelize the Christians? They're already evangelized as far <laughs> as I know. And uh, and he said, well, yeah. But I said, look, I said, the problem in America is not that people don't know how to become a Christian. So they don't know why in the world they ever would want to be one. There's a relevant. And I said, so what you've got here is an album that has love songs on it. Because what's important is people know that Christianity provides the context for real love. And there's political statements on there. I said, you know, what we're trying to do is, is present a vision of the gospel that encompasses all of life. And I said, so I, I've got 10 shots, essentially, at, at reaching the people who hear my music. So why am I going to waste one, you know, uh, exemplifying something that most people know anywhere can find out easy enough? I said, I'm more interested in, in you know, extending to people the reality of, of a biblical Christianity that, that really is all of, all of life. So yeah. um, they ended up signing us anyway, but, not, you know, <laughs> that's the way it goes. You know, so I don't, I'm sorry. I, that probably didn't answer the question y'all asked, but... Uh, that, that's okay. We rarely answer questions we ask. You know, <laughs> that's just the nature of things. So, um, <laughs> what, one of the things I find interesting, you, know, you were talking about you know, earlier about the, the cross-fertilization of styles and ideas and things like that. There's actually a kind of a weird parallel with the development of Renaissance festivals. Right. Which also came up, I think, starting in the early 70s yeah. and, in California and I, I actually read a, socio, a sociologist who wrote a book on Ren Fairs. Ah. And one of the things that's interesting is that world music emerges out of those. Right. Because you have people from different styles coming together. They're all playing at the fair. So they start interacting and, and so on. And it, it produced but eventually becomes world music. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's the, it's the same dynamic you're talking about except you're looking at it in, in a broader context in sort of the popular world, but just in a microcosm, you see that there. And that's my clever way of bringing medieval back into things. <laughs> well, I, it's interesting. Houston's uh, Renaissance Festival is one of the biggest in the country, and we, we got invited to play that from the first year when there weren't very many people when it first started, um, you know, which was which so... So I'm 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 with you. I'm following on that, and uh, um, the medieval vision was, you know, I mean they got some stuff wrong, but you know, comparatively speaking, in many ways, uh, their approach to integration of life as as being every area of life is reflecting Christianity was to me very attractive, uh, you know. From the time I read Tolkien, it wasn't long after that that the Jesus movement came to pass, and I was already a believer, and uh, and that that spoke to me of that. The more I researched that, the more I realized that it was, you know, a massively Christian period for whatever shortcomings it had and all that kind of stuff. I still thought that it there was so much that modern culture, especially the church, could learn. Uh, from the way they approached everything from politics to the arts to, you know, how you structure society and, and the family and everything. And I, I, uh, that was one of the reasons why I was so keen on it was because I, I thought that at least as far as the West is concerned, that was the most overwhelmingly Christian time, uh, that I think that the church has ever had and that Western society has ever had. And, uh, you know, it it seems to me that that uh, uh, more is lost than was gained by turning away from some of their visions of reality. So, so that's you know yeah. that was that was why I, I thought it was just so interesting. I mean, you know, I I, uh, I mean, because you know, I grew up as an evangelical, uh, you know, and and uh, 
you know, they they didn't know much about their roots. I mean, <laughs> you know, maybe they went back to Luther if they were really hip and knowledgeable and all this kind of stuff like that. But, you know, they tended to say, ooh, the wicked medieval period with, you know, Roman <laughs> Catholics, ooh, and stuff like that. And uh, so, you know, when I began to re- read that and, and realized that, you know, most of the, the huge thinking outside of the Reformation took place during the Middle Ages uh, with with not nearly as much uh, theological knowledge and, and worked out implications and stuff like that as we have now. So I, I've uh, always been kind of a fan of it, you know, and, and I've got to tell you, I'm not, I'm a terrible modern. I mean, I like the music and everything, but I mean, really my vision of the world is a lot closer, you know, to somebody in the Middle Ages than it is to your typical modern or postmodern. Yeah, Kevin, could you could, could sort of fill that out a little bit? I mean, I, I think I know what you're getting at, but maybe maybe uh, I'm missing something. Maybe our, our listeners don't quite follow. Can you kind of f- help us understand what you mean by that? Sure. Um, I mean, you know, in the first place, I take very seriously what the Bible says about God mediating knowledge of himself through everything that exists. And I also take pretty seriously what the Bible has to say about the other creatures that inhabit the universe. I'm I, I just don't buy the impersonal modernist yeah. universe at all. Not only are things infused, and not only do we live inside of God and and uh, and are held together by Christ and so forth, but but also besides humans, I mean, there's there's angels and demons and and uh, and I think all kinds of other creatures. I mean, Lord knows the scriptures are full of things. As a matter of fact, one of the things that bothers me the most of, in the translations of the Bible, you know, where they have satyrs and all these kind of things like that, that everybody, everybody, even the pagans up to that point in time, believed and knew and so forth are, are mistranslated because I guess people are, are, are ashamed of the scripture. And, you know, <laughs> I, I guess my problem is I just think that our view of reality as Christians must be primarily uh, dictated by, by the word of God and nothing else. So I tend to think that there's all kinds of creatures that most Modern, even even you know the reformed community that I'm part of, they tend to be very reductionist about. And I, yeah. I, uh, I'm not a reductionist. I'm much more <laughs> willing to give credence to you know to weird stuff, just because the Bible <laughs> presents a world that's a substantially weirder than anything we normally give any thought or credence to. And I think that has a lot to do with why the the world has become so, quote, secularized, you know, that we've we've accepted definitions from pagan ideas and stuff like that 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 are, you know, at odds with what Scripture teaches. So I, I don't know if that helps you. Oh, yeah, I, it, it does, yeah. I, I think that what we see, too, in the church is a, kind of a openness, uh, particularly among the young, for what you're talking about. Um, we're in an interesting time where I think we're coming out on the other end of a disenchantment phase, and there's kind of a re-enchantment of the world that's occurring all around us. And uh, some some folks just, you know, will never be comfortable with that. They're often really good folks who love the Lord and their Bibles sure. and stuff like that. But... Um, the world is a much more interesting place than they've been able to appreciate. Well, I've, I've got to tell you, I, I uh, for years I've thought, you know, if if things didn't take the direction they took philosophically and theologically, you know, a lot of the a lot of the people that were natural philosophers, we think of as scientists in the in the Renaissance period, were, you know, they didn't have a closed system. So they thought about science in that fashion. And just recently, I I, uh, I found a book and bought it. John Milbank, uh, you know, one of the radical yeah, orthodox yeah. guys, he wrote a big, long essay in it about uh, a return to the Renaissance approach to science and yeah. stuff as, as a way to sort of – and I, I, was, I was thrilled and shocked uh, that he said that. And he was fairly knowledgeable about the thinkers of that time. And, I, I mean, I, I hope yeah. that that – foreshadows, I mean, a biblically grounded kind of approach to that stuff. I, I, it seems to me that we've probably lost 300 years of advance in science just because our view of the world was, was pagan and not Christian. 
Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a great way to put it. And I think a, a, a way of putting it that might be counterintuitive to some folks, but I, I think you're right. I think uh, there's a, a greater openness to this sort of thing, particularly among physicists, um, the th- th- than, than people in, uh, sort of uh, know. know. Um, if there's a part of the scientific enterprise, modern scientific enterprise, that sort of opened the door to other kinds of things that you know we've been talking about, it's, it's physics. <clears throat> I have for years said when they first uh, when I first learned about photons being a wave and a particle, I said, "What's well, because it's a creature?" The reason they change <laughs> is not because of our way we look at them. They're probably messing with us, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean, if I if I was a photon, that's what I would do. Oh, he's looking. That's not, you know, I'd I'd be messing with them, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, that's, uh, I know you guy, mentioned that. Uh, re- oh, go ahead, Glenn. I, I know a guy out in Connecticut who's actually one of the world's leading experts on medieval German swordsmanship. Oh, that's I mean, right. he went back to the the Sechtbuchen and worked out exact. But in order to do this, he said what he needed to do was not only learn paleography, the handwriting, and Middle High German. Right. He had to go back and study how they taught, and that in turn moved to how they thought. <sighs> In, in order to adequately really interpret these manuals correctly. He's a brilliant guy. Um, but one of the things he, he said that was really interesting is that when you look at the four elements, uh, earth, air, fire, water, he says, uh, don't think of these as elements in the modern sense of the word. Think of them as states of matter. You've got solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. And they intuitively knew this because the sphere of fire is the sphere where you run into plasma. Right, right. (laughs) That's great. I'm telling you, they they were smarter than we thought they were. Or, you know, than they tell us they were, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, so Tom, we were going to say something before I rudely interrupted. No, no worries. Um, that that too is part of the fun of this show. <laughs> uh, the uh, when you mentioned you mentioned John Milbeck, and I know that he and uh, other figures like um, well, we had uh, Michael Hanby on here, uh, who uh, who was very uh. was influenced by Milbank's earlier work. He did the same thing with natural science. Paul Tyson, I think the book you're t- the essay is in a book that Paul Tyson and Peter That's Harris, exactly Harrison, right. yeah, yeah, put together, yeah, beyond, which is which science is your, and. Yes. Yeah, it was called yeah, it's a retrieval. Science and something. Yeah. yeah, they're retrieving classical natural um, philosophy as a much fuller and richer view because it actually holds to a nature as creation. And because creation isn't what the materialists and the secularists think it is, it is therefore much more alive, like you said, and, and much more spiritually enhanced. And so until we get the nature of nature correct, um, you know, in, in, in our way of approaching science, we're bracketing out all the most important things. And that's why we're in the mess we are, because we bracketed out all the significant spiritual dimensions that the creation is tied up with. And so, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a fascinating work. And it is the first time I've actually seen them move towards engaging the, the Renaissance period in a, in a more positive rather than strictly uh, critical right. way. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. yeah, my doctoral work was in. I tell people Reformation, but really the degree says Renaissance and Reformation. And I spent a lot of time working with with the humanists, um, and they have they they have a lot of really important insights um, into the nature of language and things like that that we take for granted in some level now, but we don't really grasp a lot of what they were doing with with the kind of depth that they were doing it. I mean, we got sort of a superficial knowledge, superficial um, sense of what was going on, but the, the these guys were really, they, they were really pretty sharp, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, so I'd, I'd like to tap into here, Kemper, a little bit as your pastoral work. So I'm a pastor, you're a pastor. Um, you're bringing... Uh, some things to pastoral ministry that are not typically brought to pastoral ministry, broadly speaking, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> particularly, you know, so you're, you're, you know, also, you know, you're an Episcopal uh, priest, 
uh, and you're uh, working in some other traditions, uh, uh, for example, you know, the Lutheran tradition right now, but you've had some background in Baptist sort of the theological. I grew up as a Baptist, yeah. Yeah, you know, you remind me a little bit of Patrick Henry, Patrick Henry Reardon. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but uh, he's one of the people over at Touchstone Magazine. Oh, right, right, yes. Yeah, huh? yeah. but uh, he, he grew up Baptist and has, a, has had a remarkable sort of uh, journey. But in terms of your, your own sort of pastoral work and the, and the richness that you're bringing to it, that maybe is not, uh, I guess, uh, 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 sort of taken for granted, maybe in the environments that you you find yourself in. How, how do you see that all playing out? I mean, is, are you frustrated? Are you, are you seeing people who are open or are you, uh, energized? I mean, what, well, what, what's your take on that? The, the current congregation um, that I'm serving, uh, I'm serving with uh, Frank Hart, who is, we were, we were in Atomic Opera together. And uh, so there, there, there is a substantial amount of our congregation that has come there because they, they knew our work in music and so forth. But, but it also means that there's, a, you know, our church is in this very suburban area but um, but we get a lot of people who are kind of countercultural, even though they're in that uh, in that area, and so consequently, a lot of them are are more open to a lot of this stuff than someone who is kind of more of the mainstream culture at large. Um, so now, 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 Kepper, are you in Houston right now? Yeah, I'm in I'm in Katy, which is a, one of the major suburbs of, of Houston, and uh, you know, and and of course, Houston is massively multicultural it's it's at this point they're saying it's the most multicultural city in the in the nation which i believe uh, the neighborhood i live in uh i have people from spain on one side filipinos uh a japanese couple another anglo couple um you know there's a there's a korean across the street there's a a muslim family here i mean it's it's a and that's not unusual where I live. So even in our congregation, we have, you know, people from India and so forth and so on who, who come there, uh, you know, because of that. And, uh, so it makes for, it makes for an interesting, uh, engagement. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, we're, we're, we're preaching and teaching pretty confessional kind of stuff. Um, but you know, even the, the the fact that a lot of the people that come there are, are from the counterculture, from other cultures. Uh, for instance, there's much more of an awareness of the spiritual reality of things. I, I probably uh, am more engaged in exorcism than, than tons of yeah. tons of pastors, just simply because you know we get a lot of people who who are demonized. So you know, that's I guess that's an aspect that uh, it's funny. I get a lot of calls from you know, the reform community and stuff like that because they don't want to call charismatics because, you know, <laughs> you know, there's no telling him I'd bark like a dog or something. But they'll call me because, you know, I'm theologically pretty conservative. So, but, right. uh, yeah. but there's that. And, uh, you know, we're, we're just, uh, you know, we believe the word and the sacraments are going to build the church. And, and uh, we're not very typical of a Lutheran uh body and stuff like we you know the music in the first place tends to be a blend of of hymns and and very modern things and stuff like that and even our hymns sometimes a lot of times we'll fuse uh we'll fuse a led zeppelin kind of <laughs> arrangement around something because we have the people that can play that you know well yeah if you can do it you yeah. can do it <laughs> yeah so uh, so but you know we've got uh, we've got house churches like most places where a lot of the real teaching goes on um, mm -hmm. you know at the same time we're we're teaching uh, you know using the Lutheran uh, catechisms the the small and the large case as a matter of fact I just taught the elders last night uh, from the large catechism, using those as a way to infuse scriptural, you know, deeply scriptural understanding of things. So it's 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 yeah. it's interesting. First of all, it's interesting that they're letting me do that in a Lutheran church because uh, the LCMS is very. As I, I heard, I'm the only person, the only one in the world. I had an Indian 
pastor tell me that that didn't go to Concordia <laughs> in, in the world. And, uh, I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> and, uh, but, but the Texas, you know, the Texas sin and stuff I'd, I'd preached in most of their churches or played and knew them and done stuff to help the denomination. I, I loved the stand they took back when they were heroes of mine, for, yeah. you know, for years. So, yeah. you know, so the Texas guys basically fought for me and, uh, you know, but 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 who knows that that'll last? I may get run out on a rail before it's all over with. You know, because uh, <laughs> because I'm I'm really an Anglican. You know, but uh, yeah. but well, there, uh, there 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 are, there are there are those of us who feel comfortable in kind of the margins where we are. are like if you think about a Venn, Venn diagram, yeah. you know, I've got friends from every branch of the Christian world <laughs> that I'm on good terms yeah. with. I'm I'm obviously reformed, but yeah. I I enjoy. I'll put it this way. I have better fellowship with some of my Orthodox friends and some of my Catholic friends than some of the people in my own denomination. It's just the way it works, you know. <laughs> For a lot of us, it's the way it works. And, I mean, we live in a time when, you know, we've, we've got to be staunch in our doctrinal you know, formulations and stuff like that. But at this point, we kind of need all the help we can get. Right. Every branch of the church <laughs> does in the Western culture. So, so uh, my yeah. my philosophy has always been, uh, I'll never be in a church that I wanted to go to. God will send me there, and I'll do what I can to help where I'm called. Because the church is so broken at this point that you know it's all you can yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kemper, your book, um, Liberation. I'm blanking out on the second Front. word. Liberation Front. Liberation Front, yes. Uh, actually, um, I am completing it now, and it is, I think, an excellent discussion of the church and the nature of the church. It brings in a whole lot of uh, ideas that, you know, I mean, okay, I've, I've had a lot. I mean, at my doctorate, I worked with ecclesiology. Okay, so I've, I've got a lot of those things with the church, but there, there are, are a a number of particular ideas and angles that you bring out in that that I had never really thought through. And I just as, as a vote of uh, support, I found it a really very interesting book um, and, you know, dealing with the nature of the church. And one of the key points you make is that the church is universal. Right. You know, that that it, it you know, when we meet to worship, we are meeting with the church from all ages, um, the past, present, and future, across denominations, everything else. This, the sense of universality that you get through the book, I think, was really good, as well as, you know, sort of the spiritual dimensions of worship as well. well so I, I, I very I, much enjoyed that. I appreciate your saying so, because, you know, I, that book, I, it came from me teaching a high school and college group in a retreat, uh, and I, so I was trying to pitch it you know, to people with that kind of understanding. And it was kind of weird, kind of revival broke out. And then they went back to their church and taught them that stuff. And since then I've taught adults, so I, I tried to write it as simply as possible. Yeah, you know? and, and it, it is written at a, a very much a lay level. Yeah. But the ideas are, are are communicated clearly at a lay level, but they're really powerful. Well, coming from you, I mean, in the first place, you know, I'm on this podcast with, with two of my uh, author heroes, you know, I think I, I, I think I have all of both of your books, except I don't have your your YA novel uh, because I couldn't find it for a while. But it's been showing up, so I'm about to buy it. But but Glenn, I have all of your books too, except for the one about the the one I want the most, which is one on the French Reformation, which I can't find anywhere. <laughs> yeah, but, that one that one's out of print. I'm trying to yeah. get it back in print. Well, I'm so glad to hear because I'm telling you guys, both of your writings, and Tom, I'm not trying to leave you out of this. I just don't know. If you, <laughs> but I'm but working I'm, on I'm mine. <laughs> yeah, Tom needs to get the book done. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I'm telling you, I, both of you guys I have followed and prayed for for a long time, and I was wow. really, really honored to be able to come be on this because your books have, both of you guys' books have helped me immensely, and I've given them away to tons of people. Wow, well, well I'm very yeah, you know, honored. And, and Chris's young adult novel actually has a second book 
and then a third <laughs> book, neither of which have appeared in years. Wow. And, um, and I have to say I, I this. Understand, I understand, Chris. Right I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you it's, 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 it's not my fault. <laughs> uh, so that, um, yeah, I, I, I'd just like to throw out a couple of other things. I know we're getting toward the end of the hour, but um, Liberation Front, I think, is a really good read and really worth worth pursuing. Yes. Uh, we, ha we, we never really got in, in your musical career, except for one reference to Reliquarium, we never really got past Archangel. Right. Um, my sense is your best known album is probably The Vigil. There's no question about it. Yeah, which is it? That's a concept album uh, of a night spending a night in prayer before going on. Well, really, crusade. Yeah, that's right. Um, which was which was a common practice in the period, and incorporates some medieval saltarellos and a number of other um, medieval elements uh, directly in there. But it it it's also very orchestral in yeah. in, in a number of places. Um, th that is the album my kids grew up on. Ah. Oh, and they, nice. they, both of them absolutely love it. Um, then uh, uh, Reliquarium, you mentioned, there's also your Medieval Christmas. Yeah, Medieval um, Christmas, yeah. the, uh, yeah, the PBS special and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that was originally, as I understand it, a CD, but now it's available as a DVD CD combo. Yes, that's exactly right. And uh, so, which yeah, interestingly yeah. enough was the, the most viewed program in American history yeah. wow really yeah well, yeah which it, i didn't believe they told me that and i said you guys are on crack or something but, <laughs> but they showed me they showed me the nielsen reports and they were right uh, which I, uh, I you know i didn't expect that uh it not not a whole lot's come out of that i'm not you know wealthy or anything but but because uh, i didn't expect that to happen you couldn't even get it during that period of time, so right. it was it was it was interesting. But is it is it available somewhere? Like maybe on YouTube now, or uh, uh, I think so. You can see it on YouTube, and you know, uh, it's still for you sale at places. Yeah, you can buy it on Amazon. Yeah, exactly. yeah we, we should we should yeah. definitely link it in the show notes. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So mm -hmm. anyway, I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt you, Glenn. But oh no, no, that, that's yeah. quite all right. I I just. I wanted to get a little more of your music out there, so that people were, would would know some more of the things that you've done. Yeah, well, the, well uh, I'm, I'm I'm preparing. Once I finish the project, I'm producing for another guy to record the Quest, which is the sequel to the Vigil. The Vigil is one of a trilogy, and you know, and then uh, you know, I got involved more in mainstream stuff, which was paid better at the time. So, so I never went on to do the Quest, and then there's a third part that's called the Throning. So you've got the church contemplative, the church militant, and the church triumphant. You know, they're yeah. they're all concept albums built around around that. So hopefully, uh, Lord willing, if if God will give me the time and the resources, I'll do that at some point this year. It'll be interesting to see if the second album gets out before the second book in Chris's trilogy gets out. <laughs> <laughs> or mine. <am> <laughs> Yeah, keep twisting that knife, Glenn. <laughs> well, Kemper, this has been great. I mean, uh, there are a number of things that we'll want to link in the show notes. Is there a place where people can go to learn more about your work? Yeah, um, KemperCrab.net is my website. I have a Patreon uh, uh, weekly teaching that people subscribe to, which is just Patreon.com slash KemperCrab. Um, I, I can't think of, of anything else. I mean, there's, you can do a Google search and find those, I think, um, you know, so. Yeah, this has been rich. This has been rich stuff. I mean, you, the range of your uh, work, I think, is just great. We, we should, would it, would it be a problem for us to link your church to? I mean, there may be people in the Houston area. Oh, no, that, that would, that would probably be really good. Yeah, it's, it's called New Church. It's a, a new church dot love. Unfortunately, but <laughs> church dot love. Uh, but I think I think dot com will link it too. That that wasn't my doing, you know. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, new church dot dot love, and and people can go there. And I, you know, we we would of course 
welcome anybody who wants to come visit. Well, I know my 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 daughter in law. One of my daughter in laws are is from Houston, and I know my oldest son and uh, you know his wife and our grandchildren get down there a lot. So uh, I, I'm sure they'll drop in on you at some point. I'd love to meet them. Right, right. Well, anyway, uh, this has been great stuff. Uh, is there anything uh, you guys want to say as we wrap up? Uh, how about you, Glenn or Tom? Oh, and we start with you, Tom. Uh, it's just thank you for coming on and sharing. This has been really an honor, and uh, and it, it the thing that I think uh, overall is the the fact that the work you do has been resonating a lot of the themes we've been on to in our own way, and and really uh, we we really appreciate that whole body of work. That's why and, that's uh, why I love your podcast. That's why I love it. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you. That's great. So, uh, Glenn, anything you want to say as we wrap up? Well, just uh, again, thank you. I have um, I've, I've been an admirer of your work on a whole lot of different levels for a very long time, and I'm just really thrilled that you agreed to come on. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm happy to do it anytime, guys. It's, I mean, I love this. I love having been on this because it's one of my favorite things. You know, I'm not a huge yeah. internet guy, but but uh, you guys are worth the <laughs> Well, we're honored that you feel that way, and <laughs> and I imagine I'll be down in Houston sometime and be uh, I'll, I'll pop in on you at, at some oh, point. That, that'd be great. I'll take you some text mix. All right, all right, I like that. <laughs> that's, that's, that sounds great. That sounds great. Well, thank you very much for listening to a theology podcast. Uh, it's been great to have Kevin Crab on the show, and uh, we're going to have a lot of links in the show notes to stuff that he's uh, done, and uh, we encur- we encourage you to 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 check those out and uh, enjoy more of his work. Uh, if you'd like to support us, uh, that's great too. We have our own uh, Patreon page and we have a number of people who support us on an ongoing basis just to cover the cost of the show. We don't take any money. It's all gone. all goes into producing each episode and we appreciate all the folks who do that uh, on an ongoing basis. Anyway, that's enough for now. Thanks a lot and bye-bye. Bye. 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 The Theology Podcast is a ministry of Trinity Reformed Church in Huntsville, Alabama. If you like this podcast, you might enjoy another of our podcasts, The Good Life Podcast, featuring Matt Carpenter interviewing experts in their field about how their work contributes to the good life.